Welcome back to the studio. And for the next 30 minutes, we're in conversation with Chelsea Manning and Harry Halpin. Welcome to the program. Hello to you both. Uh, Chelsea Manning needs no introduction, but I will do my best to provide a brief introduction. Uh, she is a network security and artificial intelligence expert and also one of the uh, most well-known whistleblowers on the face of the planet. She served seven years in military prison before President Barack Obama commuted her sentence and she was released in 2017. Now, among many other things, she is an advisor at NIMTEC which is where Harry Halpin is from. He is the co-founder and CEO. So both of you are connected uh, to NIMTEC. So uh, we don't want to talk too much about the company. Uh, we discussed this beforehand. Um, and Harry, why don't we start, though, so you can quickly tell us what you and Chelsea are trying to do uh, via NIMTEC. And, uh, and of course, um, there's been some criticism uh, about the fact that it's a token-based ID platform and, and, and so on. Uh, over to you, Harry. Yeah, we're a um, effectively a privacy project. We're not an identity project. And our goal is to make a system which effectively can prevent what's called mass surveillance. So mass surveillance is when governments can watch all the inputs and outputs of a network and determine when someone is talking to someone else. Hello, Harry. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was, I was just that. That's what we were doing. So we were originally funded by the uh, European Commission, and essentially because the threat model of a VPN or Tor does not really make much sense uh, when you are dealing with nation-state level adversaries such as the NSA or even, for example, the Chinese government, or uh, at this point, almost anyone. And uh, furthermore, we did pursue the path uh, with the approval of the European Commission, the path of working on cryptocurrency technologies, uh, because to be honest, uh, we didn't want to be dependent on US government funding. We didn't want to be dependent on a lot of other venture capital based funding. So we took tokenized funding because that's the easiest funding to take. And uh, we are kind of against putting identity systems on the blockchain in general. Um, we are instead we provide privacy so people can selectively reveal their identity. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much for explaining what the company does. Um, so I think, you know, one thing you mentioned, um, and, and before we go in and dive in, I just want to remind everyone, please throw in your questions. We're going to, I anticipate a lot of questions, so we're going to try to get through as many as possible. But the earlier you submit your questions, uh, the most likely we'll be able to get to them. And, and so um, you talk about decentralization um, and also mentioned Tor. Tor. Chelsea, could you talk about this um, Signal, Tor, these are centralized systems. Um, what you're working on with uh, Harry is decentralized. Uh, why? So one of the issues with uh, with centralization is that um, whenever you have centralized servers that hold keys or that transfer information or you know what nodes are on a peer to peer network, one of the problems is is that uh, if there's it becomes a single point of failure. So if that if you are able to target and take down that node or that series of nodes uh, on the network, uh, either legally. Uh, Ill, you know, through a DDoS attack or uh, by cutting off IP addresses or anything like that. Uh, one of the problems that you have with decentralized networks is that um, you're able to essentially, you know, either compromise the network or prevent uh, the transfer of packets from continuing to, to occur across the network. Uh, but, you know, I imagine that Signal is probably one of the most widely used, if not the most widely used app for a lot of people at RightsCon who think that the security is... is is good. Um, has there been cases where uh, this uh, weakness that you point out, this uh, single point of failure, has manifested either via Signal or Tor or other applications like them? Sure. There's been a number of instances that, not necessarily with Signal, but uh, certainly with uh, certain VPN services and uh, with it with a number of different, uh, you know, like uh, I mean, even Tor itself is, you know, had had issues uh, and ha and there's a constant uh, battle. With no, with, with sort of nodes in some in some hostile states, like you know, I'm, I'm thinking of China in particular, mm. uh, and 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 obviously some uh, some you know some of these uh, like 
uh, app-based uh, encrypt en encrypted messaging services. Um, they they are prone to uh, receiving subpoenas or having to be in compliance with certain government agencies, depending on the jurisdiction that they're operating out of. Um, and you know this this has happened in the past, and obviously there's been more specific cases in which this has happened where it's been like, oh, this is supposed to compromise six people as opposed to the entire network. But mm. certainly uh, this happened with telecommunication, uh, tele telecommunications before encryption. And so we're just, you know, you're just trying to prevent this from sort of happening with encrypted things as it becomes more and more of the infrastructure backbone of society. So tell us a little bit more about decentralization and um, the advantages and what makes it a potentially better uh, way of dealing with privacy. So one of the advantages to decentralization is that you essentially don't have uh, you, you don't have the single point of failure. So uh, consensus based networks, uh, you know, t they, t they tend to be blockchain based or whatever. Um, but these decentralized networks uh, sort of have a governance model that's more uh, that that's more horizontal, where it's more based on sort of a, a an actual peer to peer uh, consensus based module. Uh, uh, you know, system, and so you don't have as many, you don't have as many issues, you don't have as many situations where uh, these these things are going to crop up as issues or, or as failures uh, across the network. Uh, how receptive has the privacy community been um, looking at decentralization networks as um, a possibility? I mean, I ask this because there's just a lot of skepticism uh, these mm -hmm. days about uh, blockchain and so on. Right, uh, and I'm I'm one of those skeptics, uh, which is I think a, uh, where I'm placed in sort of an awkward position is that generally uh, I think the block based, block based blockchain based uh, infrastructure is sort of a problem. Uh, there's there's a number of different cultural problems with uh, within the blockchain space, especially cryptocurrency space. I'm very skeptical of cryptocurrency uh, and sort of the the community and the the the, the uh, inherent. Uh, Wealth based, uh, you know, the sort of wealth and, and asset, uh, you know, uh, accumulation based model, uh, sort of, cap, you know, like almost, almost cap, like uh, just a re replication and recreation of the capitalist infrastructure of, you know, the mon of the fiat monetary system. Um, so, but the, separate and apart from that, uh, the privacy community has always wanted decentralization, has been trying to move towards decentralization. That's what Tor is uh, uh, set out to do. But uh, one of the problems with the, with these decentralized models is sort of incentivizing people to you know participate in the network and to be uh, you know the, the stuff works on a smaller scale and it can be de decentralized at a smaller scale. We've seen this uh, in 2019 with the protest movements in Hong Kong, where uh, you know sort of decentralized uh, privacy-based uh, encrypted networks were able to be set up on the ground. Uh, but it, you know, like the, the maintenance of that and the 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 consistency of that, and to make sure that that kind of thing is can be scaled up, has been a significant problem. And I think that one of the that one of the uh, the innovations of the sort of NIM model is is to sort of uh, experiment with a, with a, with an incentivization with the incentivization structure in order to ensure that there are the uh, the, the there, there's a certain threshold nodes across the network to ensure the the actual security of the network yeah okay. and and I'll just want to add yeah. to this just to Carrie. be a little bit a little bit straightforward um, you know a lot of people so uh, I was just in Beirut last week for NIM hackathon and we're going to do our next hackathon uh, likely in Ukraine a lot of people in the global south, or in Eastern Europe, uh, have to be honest, uh, you know, economic issues, um, and they 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 do need funding, and they don't have the resources or the connections to write government grant proposals. Um, and I know Rights Connect has done a wonderful job reaching out to these communities, uh, but you know, you do want the ability for people in uh, the countries that are actually having some of the the problems that the software is trying to address in terms of surveillance to be able to use the software, run the nodes themselves. And this requires some economic incentives. Volunteer, uh, the, the bet that NIM is making is that volunteer altruistic models where the people that run the nodes in a privacy network uh, have to essentially volunteer the hardware uh, cost do not probably scale. So our community, uh, in terms of at least telegram numbers, has a large amount of Chinese involvement, Ukrainian involvement, Russian involvement, Vietnamese involvement, Turkish involvement. It's a very different uh, kind of composition 
uh, than what we've seen elsewhere. Now, a lot of those people are probably out there just to make money running a node. And, you know, we may not agree with that. I, I personally run a Tor node. I use Signal. I use Tor. Mm -hmm. I think there's wonderful technologies. However, that being said, I also think that it's completely valid for someone to participate in a privacy network in order to make some money. Uh, so that they can, and it's better that they contribute to a privacy network that helps people uh, defend human rights and fight surveillance uh, than another kind of network. Uh, for example, some sort of degenerate uh, gambling network. And this is this is a, a very different model than I think the volunteer state-funded model that we're used to in privacy enhancing technologies. But I do think it's something that privacy enhancing technologies people were looking at in the 90s. And yeah, there are a lot of problems with Web3. There's a lot of scams. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of Ponzi schemes. I'm personally very happy to see some of them collapse. Uh, that being said, I do think it's important to look at sustainable economic models, uh, which aren't dependent uh, on, the, no matter how wonderful the, the grant giving body is or how terrible, that aren't dependent on external of funding sources and become self-sustainable. I think that's a model that has a lot of appeal uh, throughout the world. And so we're just kind of giving a shot. Now it may not work, we're not right. sure yet, but we'll see. I mean, I think it goes to the heart of one of the issues, which is that privacy is a human right, but it tends too often to become uh, privacy is a privilege for those who can afford it, right? On a very basic level for people who are tuning in who might not be able to, um, who, are, who don't know too much about Web3, we can go, uh, to something simpler, I don't know if this is a good analogy, but I think of the uh, Android phone versus the iPhone, right? You pay that premium for the iPhone uh, to have the better security. At least that's how Apple uh, likes to sort of um, market it. So can you talk a little bit about uh, uh, the direction you're headed in? What are the vulnerabilities uh, and the weaknesses of that? You, you touch on the need for, for the economic incentive, but other, other challenges um, that I think decentralization faces. Sure, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges, in my opinion, of decentralization is ensuring that, uh, that you don't have, uh, and this is what Harry was sort of alluding to, is that you don't have uh, the, the network be uh, sort of, because, it, because there's nobody managing the network at, at like a 50,000 foot view, you know, a sort of top down approach to these things. Uh, one of the things that we've seen with, with attempts at decentralized networks is that they, they be, is that they become heavily concentrated in certain regions where there are, reg there are some regions that benefit better than others, you know, in terms of, uh, in, in terms of the distribution. So you want to make sure that the, that the network is as distributed evenly as possible across the whole thing. And there's no real way to ensure that um, you know, because there, there isn't, uh, there isn't, you know, with a consensus-based infrastructure, you're not having that sort of like, okay, we're going to put servers here, 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 and here. You are really dependent upon the sort of organic nature of, of, the, of, of the network itself. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that I have an interest in, do, in, in doing with, with, with NIM in particular mm -hmm. is, is sort of having a, a hardware and infrastructure approach and, and, and trying to ensure that uh, out in uh, hot regions that are hostile to sort of having a, a large server farm, for instance, you want to be able to use a small mobile device or, or, or something like that to be able to run these nodes. And for the average user uh, that, that, uses a, that uses a tool like this, they're not going to have to deal with any of the, the infrastructure stuff. All of this stuff is at an infrastructure layer. The, the person who's running an app, the whatever quote unquote killer signal like app that yeah. you just download on your on your on your mobile device is just going to work and you're not going to have to fuss around with, you know, understanding anything about any of this stuff. It'll just work. Great. Now, this conversation is about the future of privacy. And so I wanted to throw out um, other considerations about um, um, uh, concepts related to privacy that most people uh, don't necessarily consider. Chelsea, I know that you care a lot about uh, considering privacy as a health issue. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, you know, from my own experience in prison and being uh, held in both uh, a, a, just over a year of solitary confinement and then another, uh, all, you know, six or seven years of being out in um, general population where I'm actually interacting with other prisoners, um, I've, I view privacy uh, and lack thereof of privacy as sort of a health issue because when you're being observed or you, you know that you ha are at risk of being observed at any given time in, in a certain space, um, that could be very exhausting and alienating, uh, especially if you don't know who's doing the observing. So one of the things that I've noticed with, with sort of the transition 
from uh, I, I remember I, I remember I recall that I uh, something like nine percent of people were quote unquote not extremely online, uh, and that number is bumped up uh, or in, extremely online in tw in two thousand nineteen, and that number bumped up to I think close to thirty percent by uh, by twenty by the end of twenty twenty one, mostly due to the transition of things over over uh, to virtual because of the pandemic right. uh, and and the restriction methods that were in place because of that. Um, I, so one of the things that we've seen from a health perspective is that it's just it's just to ha not knowing and being alienated via via this sort of me method is I think having a, a significant health impact on people. I, and I think it is making people more tired. It's making people more mm. exhausted. It's making people feel like they don't have because it used to be that when you worked a nine to five job, you would go home at the at the night right. and you wouldn't have to worry about work anymore. Now you're connected twenty four seven and and it's it's like impacting your sleep patterns and you know. And your ability to, to to concentrate, you know, on your day to day tasks or, or going out shopping or whatever, like our lives are being integrated in this really uncomfortable virtual space. And I think that I think that the lack of privacy uh, and protections in that air, in that realm. And one of the things that I'm advocating for is is like is, is mandated sort of time periods where you you're where companies can't call you or email you for a certain period of time. Well, I, I think that, that, that happens I think in that's Europe, a factor too. in certain countries yeah. in Europe, right? You're, you're not allowed to send emails or. or or anything after a certain hour, there is no expectation. Exactly. I think France actually made a law or something. Don't quote me on that, but I, I'm absolutely certain at least one country in Europe has done that. And I think no, it's- uh, France has, your France friend. has, okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Harry. I, I think we're gonna go to questions right now. I wanted to start questions early because I know that at least uh, 200 people signed up or something like that, and there's lots of questions. Um, so the first one is from uh, Domingo and he is asking that the NIM white paper's disclaimer states that NIM tokens are not to be traded as securities in the U.S., such as to not violate the 1933 Securities Act. However, on your blog, it states that token holders can earn an APY of up to 45% in annualized returns, about 3 to 4% each month. Um, and he's saying this can't fit the definition of an investment and may bring regulatory problems. How can NIMTech address this contradiction? I think this one is for you, Harry. Yeah, so uh, I used to work at MIT. I took you know, classes with Gary Ginsler, who's now head of SEC. And uh, there's a reason NIM is not a company uh, based in the United States. We are based in Switzerland, uh, where cryptocurrencies have a, a very clear regulatory framework. We have filed a prospectus that has been verified uh, by the first prospectus authorities, uh, particularly BX and SIX. Uh, and we have registration with FINMA, which is the Swiss Financial Authority. And we're currently working to register with other authorities. Because the US rules around uh, this kind of technology is unclear in terms of how to register it, uh, we are not registering currently in the, in the United States until those rules are clear. So we purposefully exclude node runners in the U.S. Um, and that's interesting because, you know, most other privacy projects have a lot of node runners in the U.S. And by excluding the U.S., we've actually let people from other countries kind of step up. So I think overall, it's a good thing. Yes, you can get more NIM if you uh, run a mixed node. That's the whole point. Um, the whole point is to give someone privacy, but the mix the number of NIM you have is a, uh, is a kind of a reputation. It states how mm. effectively you're mixing tokens and provisioning privacy to other people. Currently, because there's very few, a lot less than we wanted, I think there's about 500 mixed nodes uh, provisioning privacy. We have uh, it, we, we kind of increase people's reputation rapidly. Uh, that will slow down as the system matures. So I hope that answers the question. I do apologize for any people that want to run nodes in the US. You will just have to wait. <laughs> OK, so here's another follow-up question. Uh, it's quite long. I'm going to try to summarize it and hopefully get it right. Uh, but they're talking about the reward system for NIM um, seems to reward users that contribute to infrastructure. I think you just mentioned that. It's centralized in that a very small number of participants control over 90% of the network. This is something that we uh, see with a lot of other blockchain, um, uh, I don't know, what the proper word is, blockchain platforms. Um, and, and so I guess the concern is um, that early, early users are the big beneficiaries 
um, and that, uh, sorry, I'm just going through. Uh, so with no ways to validate that these groups are under the, okay, so yeah. Um, if such an entity wished to censor the NIM network, so they're wondering about, um, I, I think I, I see the you, point. You've got I can it. Answer okay, this all right. Quite quickly. But, okay. So I think that the the question is stating how is it that we can prevent the NSA or another you know evil from co opting uh, yes. oligarch, let's say Putin, from just buying a gazillion nodes with all his infinite money or their infinite money and just uh, co opting a network. So I think there's there's two aspects of this question. Mm -hmm. So one is that a mixed network because each unlike Tor or VPN, each packet is routed independently. So to compromise a single packet, you have to control about eighty percent of the nodes, and to compromise a stream of packets, you have to you have to get a bunch more. So it's it, it is harder. I just want to say it, the baseline to compromise a mixed network is harder uh, than most than like say Bitcoin. Now that being said, there is a danger um, that someone tries to run a lot a lot of nodes. So we have two ways of dealing with it. One is actually in that paper. It's in section six. It's a little bit hard to read. There's a new version coming out, uh, part of the MIT Crypto Economic Systems Journal, I think uh, later this week. Uh, but essentially what we have is we have what we call saturation points. So if a certain, if there's certain people, there's two ways to combat this, this a Sybil attack, you could say. Uh, one, uh, one is we do force them to do work. So if, if Putin and NSA are doing a lot of work, mm -hmm. they're running a lot of notes, it's not necessarily bad as long as they're not running enough to compromise the network. How do you make sure they're not running enough to compromise the network? First, you make it economically irrational to basically, we do delegate staking, like voting on the reputation of nodes. So, you know, maybe the Putin and NSA are very popular, but the pattern of how people would vote, let's say I run a million nodes and we all vote for ourselves, uh, that's very easy to detect. It's easy to detect that that's corrupt and because it doesn't follow an organic uh, kind of power law or which is unfortunately called rich get richer because that is indeed the phenomenon, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a way to kind of distribute the nodes among actors. So essentially we use social network analysis and this kind of reputation voting mechanism to defeat uh, these kinds of attacks. And these are kind of significant, um, I would say innovations that go beyond what uh, let's say Bitcoin does. And I do agree Bitcoin is, uh, Bitcoin is heavily centralized. I do agree it's imperfect. It's just interesting because it's one of the few decentralized systems uh, where incentives work. We've had a lot of previous experiments in decentralized systems where we, while they haven't been compromised per right. se in an obvious manner, they have, for example- well, they were like, compromised. You, they were compromised yeah, well, by, yeah, by design. No donation, yeah, by example. design. Yeah. <laughs> They were designed to be, they were designed to benefit the people who founded it and created it. Yeah, we're trying to just build a, a very different design. We're trying to ensure some level of decentralization and also let the community kind of vote for who they like. And they kind of use statistics to determine if those people are likely adversaries or not. That's not perfect, but then nothing is. Got it. Uh, the short, the short, plain, ver the, the short, plain English version of, of all that is... <laughs> Uh, there are technical is that there are technical limitations built into the system that actually mean that uh, those kinds of act those kinds of actors can't can't either can't do that or they will actually make the the network stronger mm. by participating in the network. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Next question is um, I don't know who it's from, but they're asking: Does Tor uh, not have a lot of similar protection mechanisms like node reputation? or detecting corrupt uh, nodes. I don't know if it's node repetition, that's what they mean. How, how would you describe yeah, yeah. the security advantage of your system over Tor? So this is, this is one of my, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to ha invest in a mixed net in general. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2016, I made, the pro I made a separate proposal, uh, very similar to NIM, uh, that didn't have the incentivization structure that, uh, or you know, the node incentivization structure that NIM that NIM has. But I want, but I wanted a mixed node structure that was virtually identical to this, apart from in, in every other respect. And that was mostly because of the fact that Tor has identified that this is a problem. Mm. Tor nodes, there are malicious Tor nodes. There are networks that uh, tra that that tag and pipe uh, Tor traffic through routes in which they can monitor. This is an ongoing thing. It has been a, it has been a, it has been a constant uh, arms race between uh, Tor developers, the people who run uh, good nodes and people who use the network, uh, you know, a, a, as regular clients um, versus 
these malicious actors who are running bad nodes. They are piping, uh, they're, they're piping and monitoring and sniffing uh, the network. They're mm -hmm. running, they're like r running dummy pa packets across the network, you know, to be able to trace these things. There's a lot going on with, with Tor that, uh, that a mixnet specifically is designed to address. And uh, and just the mixnet portion, because one of the things I think is is going on here is that there is that there are two major components to NIM, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a bit of a step back uh, to the to the entire uh, discussion here. Sure. Is that there's the NIM there, there's the NIM node network and the incentivization structure, which is the the blockchain portion, and then there's the mixnet, right? And the mixnet portion is what. Is, is what I'm talking about here. That is that is the the packets being transferred across the network, and and that is that is a that is a step up. That is a that is an innovation too. And that is um, it doesn't mean that there's anything necessarily wrong with what Tor was trying to do. It's right. just that this is technically more this is technically uh, better from like a from from uh, from a security perspective and a privacy perspective and an anonymization perspective mm -hmm. than than the Tor network because it's it's an upgrade too. Okay. Can, can I can I add just one little thing? Yes. Which is first thing is that I mean there are inherent limitations in them. It will probably always be slower than Tor. I wouldn't recommend yes. human rights activists use it next year or two. It's still very experimental software. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, Tor is designed very much on purpose, uh, the way it was. I discussed intensively the Tor uh, and Moxie as well, who's very against decentralization for very good reasons in terms of quality control. Right. The NIM network, and I think more or less. The logic of Tor is that a system which is based on altruism, uh, you, you cannot put it in an adversarial environment immediately. It would change how the community works. I think the community is one of the strongest bits of Tor. Again, I run a Tor relay. I use Tor every day. I recommend mm -hmm. everyone use Tor constantly. It's, it's a great and wonderful piece of software, mm -hmm. and it defends against most adversaries. And may, probably is the best you're going to get in terms of defending web browsing. Mixnets are more for things like Signal, cryptocurrency message-based traffic, just technically. Got it. Uh, that being said, we're just doing a bet. We're saying, well, maybe we can make an economically sustainable system which can survive in an adversarial environment. This is a very different bet than before. Ah, very interesting. So it's a bet, you don't know. Um, yeah. Last question, I think, or maybe, maybe we have time for two more, but Sarah asks, can Web3 offer ways for rights advocates and whistleblowers to communicate in highly restrictive countries where civil society is restricted? Uh, I think our conversation has addressed quite a bit of that, but... Um, That's the goal of NIM. <laughs> exactly, but what about uh, other possibilities out there in addition to what NIM is trying to do? Um, are you seeing other interesting startups and organizations organizations trying to do that in Web3? Well, one of the precursors to NIM and actually would work well with NIM if it were to actually work is, uh, is SecureDrop. You know, that was a, that was a mm -hmm. network in order to, uh, in order to provide journalists with the ability to, to have sort of a Dropbox of information to and deal have with this integrated. Yeah, to yeah and, to have, and to have this integrated. Yeah, yeah. so, so like, these, these things are already happening. There are many tools that do this stuff. Um, that are that are designed to do this stuff. Tor is uh, like these are and these are layered applications. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there's one application that you choose over the other. Sometimes they stack. And I mm -hmm. think that um, there there are a number of tools that uh, would integrate well uh, in, in uh, and provide the same the, the same kind of uh, protections and guarantees that um, that are needed for that that kind of threat threat group. The problem is is that they're not very easy to do, and they're not and it's not very easy to learn how to do these things. So we need to make it as simple and easy and as uh, non-technical as possible. Got it. Well, thank you so much, Chelsea and Harry, for joining us in the studio. And thank you to the audience for thank following you. along. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you again soon. And as always, stay engaged.